Isn't it just good to sing about the gospel and be reminded? Christ stands for us. My sinless soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. If you've got your Bible this morning, be finding the book of Romans. Romans chapter 15. Romans 15, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 7 this morning. And this message is essentially me digesting and unpacking for you all the Lord did in my week last week as you allowed me to be away at a conference called The Gospel Community on Mission. And this happens to be the title of the message as well. The Gospel Community on Mission What does it mean to be a gospel people? We call ourselves evangelicals, evangelical Christians. Evangel means gospel. We are gospel Christians. We are gospel people. What does it mean to be a community built around the gospel? To be a community shaped by what God has done for us in Christ? What does that look like? In the book of Romans, Paul spends 11 chapters unpacking this gospel, what Christ has done for you. And then beginning in chapter 12, he says, okay, you have this gospel and you are believing it. Now here's how this gospel calls you to live. Because you believe this, this is what it should be doing in your life. And we're just going to look at that, a small section of Paul's application in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. And this should be nothing new to you this morning. Uh, The Holy Spirit already teaches you this, and His Spirit should be confirming in you, yes, this is how we as a people who have heard the gospel and received it, and as individuals who have been changed by this gospel, how we should treat one another, and how we should be on mission in the world. So I want to ask the question, what does it look like for us to be the gospel community on mission in the world. If you have an outline, I'm going to go through it with you. Beginning in verse 1, what does it look like? It means that we bear one another's weaknesses. We bear one another's weaknesses. Look at verse 1. Paul says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. We who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. You know, have you you ever met someone who said being born again meant you entered into a state of sinlessness, sinless perfection? They haven't heard Paul here. There's people in the church and they're weak. They're weak. We are weak. We have weaknesses. We are not perfect. We are a weak people and are to bear with one another's weaknesses. Ministry will always be messy because we're dealing with weak people. I'm weak, you're weak, and we are called to bear with one another's weaknesses. If we wanted to get rid of the mess, we have to get rid of people, right? You've ever heard, if there's a perfect church out there, don't go join it because you'll mess it up once you're, once you're there. There's no such thing. Ministry is messy because we're dealing with people. And people have messy lives. We are weak, Paul says. We are to bear with the weaknesses of those without strength. The gospel calls us, Paul calls us here to embrace the mess. Embrace those. Embrace the brother who is weak. Believing that Jesus is powerful in the middle of weakness. That in our weaknesses, Christ has opportunity to prove himself strong. That's why Paul says, I am content with my weaknesses. For when I am weak, God proves himself strong. Christ is strong in me. Embrace weakness. For when we are weak, then we are strong. Christ bears with your weaknesses, doesn't he? You're weak. Christ bears with your weaknesses. And he calls you to do the same. Bear with those who are weak. So I'd I'd ask you, Whose weaknesses do you bear? Do you even know the weaknesses of others? Does anybody even know your weaknesses? 
Do you feel the freedom to expose yourself to others, to expose your heart, to expose your weakness to others? I'm afraid too many of us are scared, are scared of the moral outrage that may come up if we open up our hearts and share our sin, share our weaknesses with others. We prefer to hide and sin secretly than to open up to others and share where we, where we are weak, where we are struggling. And perhaps if no one shares their weaknesses and struggles with you, it's because they fear your moral outrage at them. How could you be so weak? How could you be so sinful? You're, you're afraid their opinion of you would diminish. Friends, this has hit me recently that secret sins miss out on open grace. Secret sins miss out on open grace. Imagine a community where no one fears to expose their weaknesses to one another because they know that they will be met with grace and help instead of condemnation and outrage and shunning. Imagine that community where we all admit we're weak, we're sinners, and we open our lives up to each other and we help. We show grace, we show mercy, we give help to one another, not looking down. Don't you want that? Don't you want to be a part of a church like that? Don't you desire that? Because when we're not like this, we forget the gospel, that we are sinners, that we are weak. You have to come confessing that if Jesus is to be good news to you. You have to come confessing, I am poor in spirit. I am bankrupt before God. I am a sinner. You have to come like the, Pharise- like the, the, not like the Pharisee who says, God, thank you for making me so great, but like the tax collector beating his breast. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. You've got to come to God like that if you want to be justified, Jesus says. Don't you want this kind of community where we open ourselves up to one another, where we bear the weaknesses of each other? And not just please ourselves, verse 1. That's the second thing. We are to abandon selfish pleasures. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. We live in an age of individualism, don't we? Where we live privatized lives. We shut the door. We go into our home, we shut the door, and we keep the world out. We keep others out. We feel entitled to every lawful pleasure. It's my right. It's my due. But Paul says no. Paul says the gospel says no. We're to bear others' weaknesses and not just please ourselves. And not please ourselves. At the conference I went to, one of the speakers shared the story of, of him and his kids. When his kids argue over um, candy or toys or who gets to sit where, he asks them a question. Kids, what do we deserve? And the kids know the answer. What do we deserve? Death. Death. We deserve death. That's the right answer, isn't it? The wages of sin is death. We deserve death. And kids, what do we get? We got life. We got Jesus. We, we were adopted into God's family. We got forgiveness. We got the Holy Spirit. We got a kingdom that's coming. And just begin rehearsing all that the gospel tells us, all the good news we have. And that makes you care less about that toy or that seat, doesn't it? What did you deserve? I deserve death. What did I get? I got everything. I got everything. May we be a people who are so overwhelmed by what we deserved and not getting that and so overwhelmed by what we got instead in the gospel that we lay down our entitled privileges and pleasures, the things we think we have a right to in order to help our brother. Ask yourself this question. Am I willing to be inconvenienced for love's sake? Am I willing to be inconvenienced for love's sake? Jesus was, wasn't he? And that's the understatement of the year, right? Jesus left heaven, the fellowship he had always had with the Father, 
and was born a helpless child and had to eat and sleep and sweated and labored. Jesus was inconvenienced for you. For love's sake, are you willing to be inconvenienced for others, to lay aside the things I want to do, not just pleasing myself, to please my neighbor for his good? Because that's where Paul goes next. Look at verse 2. We're not just to please ourselves. Verse 2, each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. Not just please ourselves. You see the contrast. Not just please ourselves, but please our neighbor for his good, for his edification. Uh, Point number three there, we are to edify our neighbors. Edify our neighbors. Each of us, verse two says, each of us is to please his neighbor for his good. Each of us, there's no exceptions here. There's no exemptions. I'm, I'm hurt, can I be excused? No, each of us is to please his neighbor. Uh, We are all called to full-time gospel ministry to our neighbors, all of us. A good quote from the conference is that we are all called to paid full-time ministry. We just get our paychecks through different sources. We do, we do. Uh, and, And that's the way it is with you. That's the way it is. Charles gets his paycheck through barbers. Carl gets his paycheck through Randall Riley, but you're all called to full-time gospel ministry. Gospel ministry. God just gets you your paycheck through different sources, through different things. All of us are called to this. Each of us is to please his neighbor. Do good to your neighbor for his good, to his edification. Imagine a group of people so changed by the gospel that they were always on mission always on the mission of being good neighbors and always being God's people scattered out wherever they were. People couldn't get away from us, could they? People could not avoid or escape exposure to the gospel because we're, we're there. We're in their neighborhoods doing good to them. And when they ask, why? why? Why are you not like everybody else? Comes home, closes the door, and puts the world on the outside, put others on the outside. Why? Because Christ has pursued me. Because Christ did not come pleasing himself, but came doing good to me. Therefore, I do good to others. The fact is, is that we're all called to be missionaries. All of us are called to be missionaries. And this hit home for me, um, for me and Lynn, as, as our home has kind of become the neighborhood hangout for the kids in the neighborhood, inviting them in. And it's so tempting to feel... Um, like, my, my life is being invaded. I'm not getting to do what I want to do because I've got all these kids in my house. I'm playing, playing with them in the front yard. I can't do what I want to do. Um, but Lynn and I said to Lynn, you know, if, if we were on the foreign mission field and our house was the hang for the neighborhood kids, we would be overjoyed. We would be ecstatic. Everybody wants to come and be with us. I mean, that would just over, overwhelm us with thankfulness to God. Because we're living on mission. We're, we're being missionaries. And the fact is, we are missionaries in the neighborhood we're called to. Yeah, I, I was uh, talking to Seth Kennedy the other day, running around his, his neighborhood and sees somebody and feels led, you know, I, I need to engage them. And so I think he does another five-mile run around the neighborhood to, to get back there and, and starts engaging someone uh, for the purpose of sharing the gospel. I mean, this isn't the way we naturally are, is it? This isn't naturally me. It's not naturally you. It's not naturally Seth. But this is what the gospel calls us to. Ordinary people doing ordinary things with gospel intentionality. Having people into your home, ordinary. Running around the block, ordinary. But doing it with gospel intentionality. The things you already do, doing it in a way that magnifies Christ, that draws others to the gospel, This is simple, isn't it? It's very simple, but it's very demanding. Very simple. What God calls us to is very simple, but it's very demanding. On the one hand, there is a lowering of expectations. Not everyone is to be a super apostle. Not everyone is to be a super evangelist. You can't be. You're not called to be. There's a lowering of expectations, but on the other hand, there's a raising of expectations. 
Everyone is, is a sent out person now. Everyone is a missionary. Everyone is called to be on mission. Simple. What we're called to do is simple. You go shopping, take somebody with you, and, and speak truth to one another, encourage one another. You go out to eat with a friend, a co-worker, invite a Christian along, someone from our church, that y'all can speak gospel to each other and, and speak the gospel to your lost co-worker. It's very simple what God calls us to do. I think we need to ask ourselves from time to time, what things can I say no to so I can say yes to the mission God has given me? Paul says, we're not just seeking to please ourselves. What things do I need to say no to? What small things do I need to say no to so that I can say yes to the more important things? So I can say yes to living on mission. God calls you to move away from living life for self. Paul says, not just pleasing ourselves, not pleasing ourselves, moving away from that and moving toward living for our neighbor's good. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. This is what the gospel calls us to. What does it look like for us to be the gospel community on mission in the world? Next, it looks like this. We root our actions in the gospel. Look with me again, verse 2, then verse 3. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification, for even Christ did not please himself. Don't just please yourself, but please your neighbor. Why? For even Christ did not please himself. You see the connection? I, I pray that you do. This is so important. I'm not just giving you rules. Don't please yourself. There's a rule. Please your neighbor. There's another rule. We're giving you a gospel. Why do you do this? Because Christ came, and he didn't please himself. Christ came not to be served, but to serve and to pour out his life, to give his life a ransom for many. Therefore, you do it. Jesus tells us that much. If I, the Lord and Master, serve you, wash your feet, what are you to do? You're to serve one another. You're to wash one another's feet. This is not a, result, a rule. It's a result of what, of what Jesus has done for us already. The gospel is like the engine to the car. If you're, if you're a legalist, you're a Pharisee, you may have a car, but you don't have an engine to it. You've got the rules, but you don't have the power. You don't have the motivation. But with the gospel, you have the motivation. Why lay down your life for your neighbor? Because Christ laid down his life for you. Why please your neighbor? Because Christ did not please himself, but gave himself for you. You've got the motivation. You've got the engine. You've got the power. God calls us to live in a way that demands a gospel explanation. That's what Paul's doing here. Calling us not to please ourselves. That's natural. Please yourself. But seek to please your neighbor. Do good to your neighbor for his edification. That's unnatural. And when you're, when you're doing it and your neighbor asks you why, why are you doing this? Why are you being so generous with your stuff and with your time? Why are you serving me like this? Take advantage of the opportunity. Don't say, it's just what I want to do, or it makes me feel good, or it's just the right thing to do. Take advantage of the opportunity and give the gospel. I'm doing this because what Christ has done for me. I'm generous because Christ has been so generous to me. I'm serving because Christ serves me. Can you believe how good that is? Let me tell you about it. Don't waste the opportunity. Live it. Live a life that demands a gospel explanation. This is what we're called to do. Root your actions in the gospel and live a life that demands an explanation that can only be the gospel, what Christ has done for you. Also, we see this community living on mission in the world roots its hope in the Scripture. We root our hope in the Scriptures. Look again at verse 3. He says, For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, he's going to the Old Testament, quotes the Old Testament, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. And now verse 4, Paul quotes the Old Testament, now he affirms the Old Testament. Verse 4, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scripture, we might have 
hope. You see what Paul's doing? Here's the Old Testament backs this up, and now I'm affirming the Old Testament. We get perseverance, encouragement through the Scripture that we may have hope. We don't root our hope in our subjective feelings because those change, don't they? Day to day, hour to hour. We don't root our hope in our experiences. We don't root our hope in spiritual catchphrases. You know, how do you know uh, all is well with you and God? Uh, because I'm, I'm here. I wouldn't be here without God. How many times have you heard that? I wouldn't be here without God. Um, yes, you wouldn't, but there's more than that. There's more than that. Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again that you might have life. Yet yeah, that is where we find our hope. We root our hope in objective truth, not in our feelings, not in our experiences. We root our hope in truth because the truth is the same on a good day and on a bad day, right? It's the same every day. I hope you see, and I hope you have seen in life, that there is a relationship between your confidence in the Scripture and the certainty of your hope. Do you see that relationship? Your confidence in the Scripture begins to wane. Your hope begins to wane. Your confidence in the Scripture and God's promises grow. Your hope grows as well. Paul says, for whatever was written in earlier times, this is the Scriptures, was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Do you believe the Scriptures? Have hope. Being a gospel people means that we are a Bible people, now and always. We are a people of the book. We are a people of the Scripture. The Lord is not silent. He has spoken, and He has spoken to us in His Word, and we believe it. Therefore, we have hope. So what does it mean for us to be God's church on mission in the world? What does that look like? Verse 5, we depend on God. Look at verse 5. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. May the God who gives, may the God of perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind. We depend upon God. Who gives perseverance? Who gives encouragement? Verse 5, it's God. God gives. God grants. Where does it come from? It comes from God. The church is not an assembly line, a process we can fully automate to get perfect disciples out on the other end. It's not something we can do all, of our, all by ourselves. We've got to rely upon God. We've got to depend upon God. Remember Hebrews 6? You should be growing. You should move away from the elementary things. You should grow. And this we will do if God permits, the writer of Hebrews says. We're going to grow, but it's only through dependence upon God. Growing through dependence upon God. The gospel calls us to live dependent upon God. Ask yourself this. Where do we see ever in Scripture, God calling someone to do something they could do on their own. When do you ever see God doing that? Calling someone to do they could do all by themselves without dependence upon God. Moses, set my people free. Here, take this magic stick. You do it. You do it. No, it doesn't work like that. Joshua, conquer the land. Go in, march around Jericho and blow on those trumpets. You bet, I mean, these guys blowing on the trumpets... You know, God, you got to do something. We feel pretty foolish here, marching around this city, blowing these trumpets. It's not by their power. It's not by their might, but by God, by His Spirit, by depending upon Him. God always calls people to do things they can't do by themselves, to do things they must depend upon Him to do. If we lose sight of our utter dependence upon God, then, we'll, then we have forgotten the gospel and we will be of little use in the world. We've forgotten in the gospel, we come, no price in our hand we bring, only to his cross do we cling. That's how we come to God. That's how we grow. That's how we work in the world, in dependence upon God. What else? 
what does it look like to be the gospel community on mission in the world? It looks like this, verse 5 and 6, we unite in mind and heart and voice. We unite in mind and heart and voice. Uh, look at verse, verse 5. God of perseverance and encouragement grant to you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus and to be of one accord, one heart, that you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God calls us to be of one mind, heart, and voice, to unite, to be united. The gospel is a uniting force because the gospel breaks down the walls that we make, the walls between ethnic groups, Jews, Gentiles. Paul says Christ has broken down those walls and made us one body together. The walls we create between uh, rich and poor, God breaks it down. James says, you do not have to give preference. You give preference to the rich, you have forgotten the gospel. God doesn't do that. The gospel knocks down the walls between education levels, between socioeconomic groups. The gospel knocks down every wall and makes us one family, one body together so that we need one another. The eye can't be by itself. The ear can't be by itself. We all need one another. The gospel gives us a common mission together, the Great Commission. Go and make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded of you. So we have one mission, one purpose to life. The gospel gives us a common ethic together, that we are forgiving, that we love, that we are kind, that we are generous. The gospel gives us a common love for one another. God loved us so much that he gave his only son for us Therefore, we love others, giving of ourselves. Imagine a people of diverse tastes, of diverse backgrounds, all coming together and speaking with one voice, one mind, one heart. This is impossible in the world, but through God, through what Christ has done, through his gospel. May God grant us that we might be of one mind, one heart, one voice, so that we may, verse 6, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We glorify God, verse 6. This is our mission. This is the purpose of your life, to glorify God and make disciples who make other disciples. Glorify God, make disciples. This is what we do together. You're doing this as one body, speaking with one voice, glorifying God. And this is what we do as individuals in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, at our schools. Glorifying God, making disciples. We reorder our lives around this mission, around this purpose. This isn't something we tack on. I do in my free time. I make disciples. This isn't something you tack on to life. This is your life now. You realize this? You were living life for yourself. You were going your own way, had your own plans. God arrested you like he did Paul on the road to Damascus and gives you a new plan for life, gives you a new mission. And now everything else, family, desires, pursuits, pleasures, entertainments, revolve around that mission, not the other way around. We are ordinary people doing ordinary things to the glory of God. Ordinary people doing ordinary things with gospel intentionality to the glory of God. That's what God calls us to. Finally, look at verse 7. One more thing. What do we do? As the church that's been changed by the gospel on mission in the world, what do we do? Verse 7, we accept one another. Accept one another. Therefore, Paul says, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. We're called to accept one another, but did you notice why? Why are we called to accept one another? What's the motivation? What's the way in which we are to accept one another? Just as Christ also accepted you. Accept one another. Why? Christ accepted you. You get that? 
Why do you accept others? Why do you bring them into your life? Why do you accept the weak? Because Christ accepted you when you were weak. Why do you accept sinners? Because Christ accepted you when you were a sinner. Why do you accept the poor and the ostracized? God accepted you when you were poor in spirit, ostracized from Him. God accepted you. You accept one another. Our acceptance of others is to mirror to the world Christ's acceptance of us. You get that? Our acceptance of others should mirror to the world what God has done for us. And it's good to often ask yourself the question, what can I be doing with my life that would mirror to the world what God has already done for me? What can I be doing? Because if we don't accept others, we show that our heart is unmoved by God's acceptance of us. You don't accept others. Are you really believing? Is your heart really moved that God has accepted you? You don't forgive others. You hold grudges. Is your heart really moved that God has forgiven you? Are you really believing that God has forgiven you of all your sin? You don't love others. Your heart's unmoved by the love that God has for you. John says it's impossible for you to love God and hate your brother. It's impossible. A heart that loves God is moved, is moved by God's love for us, and that spills out on everyone else around us. So do you see the difference? Do you see the difference between rule and gospel? This has been so huge for me recently. The difference between rule and gospel. I can give you a rule. Accept one another. You better do it. I can give you a rule. Don't please yourself. Do good to your neighbor. Do that. And you try to man up and do it. And when you fail, you beat yourself up. You, you, you accept others, but your heart's really not in it. I don't want to accept this guy, but I got this rule. I got to accept him. Okay, come on in. Um, you see the difference between that and the gospel, which wins my heart and propels me out to do these things? The gospel wins my heart by Christ's acceptance of me, and therefore I accept others. The gospel wins my heart to forgive because God has forgiven me of so much. The gospel wins my heart against anger because God took his anger off of me and put it upon the Son. Do you see it? You see the difference? It's huge. Imagine a church that accepts others just as God has accepted them. Imagine a church that shows grace to each other just as God has shown grace to them. Imagine a church that is generous to one another in a way that reflects God's generosity toward them. This is what God calls us to, to live lives that make no sense at all apart from the gospel. Let's pray. Father, Lord, this is my prayer for myself. Lord, I confess falling so short here of living by rule and expectation of other, not by out of a heart overflowing in what you've done for me in Christ. Lord, put that heart in me. Put that heart in all of us that we would be so overwhelmed and so overjoyed by what God has done for us in Christ that we would gladly show the same grace to others, the same forgiveness to others, that we would gladly accept one another, that we would gladly open up our lives and reveal the sin, the ugliness, and the wickedness, trusting that we will receive grace in return as we've received it from you, trusting that we'll receive acceptance as we've received acceptance from you, trusting that we will receive mercy and help as we've received it. Lord, may we be a people changed by what Christ has done for us, by the full pardon and full acceptance we find in him. And may that pour out upon the world around us. May we be missionaries to our neighborhoods, to our neighbors. May we be letting go of things that we would do for ourselves, for our own pleasures. And may we rather pour ourselves out for, to reach our neighbors for Christ. Lord, may no one in this city escape hearing 
and seeing the gospel at work in our lives. May no one escape it. May everyone see and may they give glory to the Father which is in heaven as they see our works and see our lives and see how the gospel has changed us. And may you draw them to Christ for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we're going to have a time of invitation. And I'd call you to remember, secret sins and hidden weaknesses miss out on open grace. Perhaps for some, you may want to grab someone, come to the altar and say, here's my struggle, here's my sin, pray for me, pray with me. You may want to grab someone and go out one of these doors and, and just talk. Here's, here's my weaknesses, I need someone to bear with me. I have, I have hidden these things from everyone. I don't want to hide anymore. I want help. I want to, I want to receive help from someone who loves the gospel. Maybe you need to do that this morning. Maybe you need to repent, like me. You know, I've lived for self. I've not accepted others. I've avoided others. I've pushed others out of my life. And I need to accept. The altar's open if you need to come and pray. Perhaps you're afraid this morning. I've, I've been a Pharisee. Perhaps, Lord, I've been a Pharisee. No one comes to me with their sin. And I would never confess my sin to someone else. Lord, break my heart of that. I don't want to be living whitewashed on the outside and dead on the inside. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Perhaps that's you this morning. Perhaps you need to repent. I need to repent. And I confess to you as a church, you know, the first years I was here, I I think I led you to do things by rule not by gospel, by guilting you into caring for children on the other side of the world, Uh, guilting you into feeding and doing things. But forgive me, no more, forgive me. I want the gospel to be at the center of my heart and at the center of your heart. I want to lead by example, and I haven't done that. So forgive me, forgive me. This is your time. Let's, let's stand together and respond in the way the Lord leads your heart. The altar's open. Grab somebody if you need to. Come to me. I'd love to pray with you, pray for you.